We are on chapter 11 of Small Steps today. Chapter 11, Dancing the Hula, Pop and a Wheelie. Just before Thanksgiving, Miss Ballard announced, tomorrow you're gonna stand by yourself. I knew my physical therapy sessions were helping me. My arms and legs were stronger. My back was stronger too. I can now sit up for several hours at a time, but still, I worried all evening. I remember trying to stand by myself at the university hospital. The next morning, Miss Ballard helped me sit with my feet over the side of the bed. She put one arm around my waist and said, slide off until your feet hit the floor and then lock your knees. Isn't someone gonna help us, I asked. What if I fall? I won't let you fall, she said. I didn't see how she could stop me if I collapsed since I was bigger than she was. Maybe we both go down. Alice, whose bed was closest to mine, stared at me but said nothing. I wondered if she hoped I would fall. It had to be hard for her to watch new patients arrive, get better, and leave while she always remained behind with her condition unchanged. A soft voice from across the room said, good luck. Dorothy, who might never stand alone, crossed her fingers for me. My fear vanished. I slid forward and put my feet on the floor. With Miss Ballard's hand firmly on my waist, I locked my knees and stood. When Miss Ballard let go, I remained standing. I stood straight and steady with no support for a full minute, beaming at Dorothy the whole time. That's fine, said Miss Ballard. Good show, said Dorothy. From now on, said Miss Ballard, as she helped me sit on the bed, you'll stand for a while every day, and soon you'll be able to get in and out of the wheelchair by yourself. Each day I stood alone a little longer, and my confidence grew like Jack's beanstalk. Unfortunately, it grew a bit faster than my strength, and soon that got me into trouble. One evening, we were all in our beds talking about tips, trips we wanted to take. I said I'd like to go to Hawaii and learn how to do the hula. What's the hula? Alice asked. I explained that it's a traditional Hawaiian dance where the dancers wear grass skirts and sway their hips in time to the music. I never heard of any hula, Alice said. Are you making this up? I'll show you, I said. I flung back the blankets, swung my legs over the side of the bed, and stood up. I put both hands off to one side and tried to sway my hips back and forth, and instantly I crashed to the floor, landing in a heap by the side of the bed. I was strong enough to stand alone briefly, but I was clearly not strong enough to dance the hula. When the other nurses saw me go down, they panicked. Nurse, screamed Shirley. Peg fell, shouted Dorothy. Alice punched her call button over and over, which made a red light and a buzzer go on the nurse's station. Help, help everyone yelled together. Willie was close by, and she broke all speed records dashing into our room. When she saw me lying on the floor, she knelt beside me. Are you hurt? She asked. Why are you out of bed? I looked up at her. I was doing the hula, I said. The hula? Alice didn't know what the hula was, I explained. So Peg was going to show her, Dorothy added. Shaking her head in disbelief, Willie helped me into bed and warned me to stay there. In all my years of nursing, she said, I've never had a polio patient try to dance the hula. Although I wasn't more hurt, I was a bit shaken, and I meekly promised not to do the hula again. Good, said Willie. Why I write my report? Patient broke leg doing hula dance? She began to laugh, and soon all of us had a runaway case of the giggles. For days afterward, patients and staff asked me, Is it true you tried to do the hula? When I admitted that I had, the response was always the same. Incredulous laughter. My strength increased daily, and I was measured for a pair of walking sticks. If I could learn to walk with sticks, I wouldn't need the wheelchair anymore. Walking sticks are similar to crutches, except shorter. Instead of going under the armpits, they just end below the elbow. A ring of metal circles, the patient's arm at the top of each stick, and there's a wooden crossbar to hold on to. Why do I have to wait for new sticks to get here? I asked. Dorothy already has a pair and she only uses them an hour a day. She wouldn't care if I borrowed them. It's important, Miss Ballard said, for the walking sticks to be exactly the right height for you. If they're too short, even by an inch, you would have to lean forward, which would cause back problems. If the sticks are too long, you would not be able to use all of your arm strength for balance. Willie told me that using sticks strengthen the leg muscles. If you can walk with sticks, she said, you may get strong enough that you don't need them anymore. I asked Miss Ballard if this was true. No two cases are the same, she said. Then she smiled and added, I hope you'll learn to walk with them and then walk without them. Every morning I greeted Miss Ballard with, are my sticks here yet? And each day I was told to be patient. 
They're made in Canada, she said, and each pair has to be cut exactly to the right size, so it takes time. Ugh, too much time, I complained. While I waited, I learned to get from my bed to my wheelchair all by myself. This new skill was a giant step on the road to independence. Now I could get out of bed anytime I wanted. I could go to the OT room or visit someone in a different ward or simply just wheel myself up and down the hallways. I like to talk with other people and I spent a lot of time visiting parents who didn't get outside company. Remembering how Tommy had enjoyed hearing my books, I began reading aloud to the kids every day. I chatted with some of the adult patients too especially one who told me all about the pets she had at home. Ugh, I loved hearing about her animals, even though it made me kind of lonesome for my dog, BJ. The bad news, as far as the staff was concerned, was that as, is that I soon became a daredevil in my wheelchair. My favorite trick was to pop a wheelie. I pushed my wheelchair as fast as I could, and when I got to top speed, I yanked on both brakes, which forced the large back wheels of the chair to stop so suddenly that the two small front wheels were raised off the floor. I leaned against the seat as I tilted back with my feet in the air. I received several warnings about what would happen to me if I tipped up too high and crashed backwards, but I did my stunt whenever the nurses weren't looking. I never showed my parents this trick because I knew they would forbid me to do it. My roommates never mentioned it to them either, even though the other girls frequently requested a demonstration when we were alone. I was always happy to tear down the hall and pop a wheelie at the doorway of our room. My new mobility made it easier to get food my parents brought, which was stashed under my bed. The beds were high. Friends and neighbors of my family, hearing about the four girls who didn't get much company, loaded my parents with home-baked brownies, animal crackers, tins of peanuts. Mother added bags of apples and oranges and bunches of bananas. It was a regular supermarket underneath my bed. During my first weeks in the sheltering arms, the only way we could have a snack was to ask a nurse to get it for us. Often, we were told it was too close to mealtime, or the nurse was busy right then, or we had already eaten too many treats that day. After I learned to get out of bed alone, I would sit in my wheelchair and grasp the arm with my left hand so I wouldn't fall out while I reached under my bed. My wooden back scratcher, a gift from Grandpa, hooked cookie containers and pulled them out from the bed far more often than it scratched my back. Since a fresh load of food arrived each Sunday, we felt compelled to eat everything before Saturday night. I piled the goodies in my lap and wheeled them from bed to bed distributing them, not caring how close it was to mealtime or how many cookies we already ate that day. As we munched cookies after dinner one Wednesday, Willie came in and said, Peg, you have a visitor in the lobby. Me? I said. I don't see anyone else named Peg, remarked Alice. Who is it? I asked. Willie shrugged. He didn't give his name. He, said Renee and Willie. It must be Art, I said. If it was Art, Renee said, he would have asked for Dorothy. Art would come up to our room, said Shirley. Is he tall, dark, and handsome, Renee asked. No, said Willie. He's tall, blonde, and cute. Woo-hoo, said Renee. You didn't tell us you had a boyfriend. Quickly, I combed my hair and got into my wheelchair. I couldn't imagine who my visitor was. I wheeled into the elevator, rode to the first floor, and went out to the lobby. Hello, Peg. <gasps> Dr. Beavis! He was even better looking in street clothes than in his white uniform. I was overjoyed to see him. I came to see how my favorite patient's doing, he said. Believe it or not, I miss your knock-knock jokes. I told him about my roommates, about the hot baths, about my physical therapy treatments with Miss Ballard. I've talked with her on the phone several times, he said. She tells me you're an exemplary patient and very brave. I wasn't sure what exemplary meant, but from the way he said it, I figured it was a compliment. I hoped he would report the part about me being brave to Mrs. Crabb. So how's Tommy? I asked. When I left, he was listening to Lone Ranger, Dr. Beavis said. Is he still in the iron lung? Yes, for now. Dr. Beavis didn't stay long, but his visit left me glowing. His parting words were, don't forget. You're going to come back to University Hospital and walk for me. I'll be there, I said, and this time we both knew it was more than wishful thinking. I just might make it. That's the end of chapter 11. She had a very special visitor in this chapter. Seems like she's kind of enjoying her stay at Sheltering Arms. So tell me what's going on in this chapter. What sort of thoughts do you have in your head? And what kind of feelings do you have in your heart?